meeting. Let's pray, and we will dig into God's Word. Father, we thank you for uh, this beautiful day that you've given to us. It's so bright outside and the sun reflecting off the snow that even some of the overheads are hard to see, but you know that's okay. It's a beautiful day. And the whiteness of the snow, uh, indeed, it reminds us of how your blood has cleansed us and, and our sins, though like crimson, have been washed and are clean and, and white as snow. Uh, we've been forgiven through what you accomplished for us. So thank you, Father for making that possible, that we can have a personal relationship with you. We can worship you today in spirit and in truth uh, through that saving work of your son, the Lord Jesus, who cleanses us of our sin and makes us right with you. God, I thank you for each one who've come to be a part of this service, and I pray, as I did in the early, that your word would, by your spirit, find fertile ground in each of our hearts, that we would receive what you have for us today, that with your help and your grace, we would apply it in the week ahead. And I pray that we would be encouraged today. We'd be edified and built up in the faith. We would draw closer to you because you certainly have reached out to us. We love you. Thank you so much for your great love. Thank you for your love letter that we can now open. In Jesus' name, I pray it. Amen. So I, I need you to raise your hands this morning. Uh, I'll give you the question. You can decide uh, how you want to answer but how many of you, by an uplifted hand, are willing to admit today in front of your brothers and sisters in Christ that at one time or another, you have blown it? <laughs> either, either relationally or spiritually, you have blown it. Thank you for keeping it real. Thank you for not leaving me hanging up here. I'm not the only one. The Bible tells us there is none righteous. No, not one. This means that all of humanity before a holy God is guilty of wrongdoing. If you're still not convinced, listen to the words of the Apostle John. He offers this reality check. If we say that we have no sin, or this indwelling principle of sin, we deceive ourselves. We literally lie to ourselves. And when we do that, we tend to make excuses. We start to... Uh, justify our actions and he continues the truth is not in us the biblical truth not as a controlling or motivating influence when we say that we have no sin but when John goes even further he says this and I have the verse 4 on the overhead if we say that we have not sinned that's a more blatant and defiant declaration we make him God a liar no longer are we just deceiving ourselves. Now we're accusing God of being a liar. Why? Because we're contradicting His truth. Because the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us measures up. And His Word, again, as a controlling or motivating influence at that moment, is not in us. What a predicament. What a... What a predicament, regardless of gender and genetics, culture, calling, or color. Basically, we're all bunking in the same boat. We're all sailing in the same ship, and that ship is sinking. So what do people normally do when the vessel they're in begins to take on water? It begins to slip beneath the waves. What do we normally do? We cry out for help, SOS! Save our ship. We're, we're in distress. We're going down. Do Christians or those in relationship with God through the new birth have someone to cry out to? They certainly do. In fact, long before trouble descends, this individual is aware of what's coming and already doing something about it. In Romans 8, Paul boldly states that nothing in all of creation... I don't care what you come up with, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But prior to this, and in light of the enormity of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, and what that means to us as individuals, he asked this question, who is to condemn in light of who Jesus is and what He's done for us, who can bring an accusation against us? Christ Jesus is the one who died. 
More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? That's a position of divine authority. That's a position of power. And what is he doing there, seated beside the Father's right hand? He is interceding for who? For us. Turns out John Walford, the past president of the Dallas Theological Seminary, was correct. Spiritual triumph for the believer is inevitably linked to the heavenly intercessor. If it wasn't for Jesus praying for us, there's no way we could make it. So before you woke up this morning, Jesus was praying. As you walked into the sanctuary, celestial petitions were being offered on your behalf. Throughout the week ahead, as you work, as you wait, as you worry, as you wonder, Christ's intercession will be covering you. Would you like to know what his prayers focus on? Would you like to know what he's actually praying for you? So would I, but we're not told. Isn't that great? I mean, we get a glimpse, generally speaking, in, in John chapter 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer for his disciples. But I believe that his prayers, when he does pray for us, are specific. They'll be geared toward whatever situation we happen to be in, as one author suggests. It might help us to recall the words of encouragement spoken to Peter when Jesus exposed the hollowness of his self-confidence. And he foretold how Peter would deny him. Do you remember what Jesus said? Peter, I have prayed for you that you will not lose your faith. Help your brothers be stronger when you come back to me. And there's the rub. All of us are susceptible to demonic darts of doubt of drifting from the faith rather than drawing closer to Christ when trials arise. And so what does Jesus do? He intercedes for His followers, enabling them to endure, enabling them to emerge on the other side, stronger or more spiritually stable. Now in recent Sundays, we've been exploring the priestly occupation <laughs> the priestly position that every Christian occupies. That's what I'm trying to say. Peter describes it for us. You ought to have this verse memorized by now. Here's how it goes. But you are a chosen people. What kind of priesthood? A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people belonging to God Himself. That you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Peter identifies God's people as belonging to a royal priesthood. It's royal because Jesus is our supreme ruler. You can't go any higher than Him. He's higher than the heavens, the Scriptures say. And it's a priesthood because we've been invested with this ministerial or priestly authority by God Himself. To what end? For what purpose? Well, that we might promote our own agenda. That we might get our way. That we might toot our own horn. And Bill's the only exception here this morning. He can toot his own horn legitimately because he's a trumpet player. Know that we might declare God's praises. Or as the message reads, do God's work and speak out for Him to tell others of the night and day difference He has made, is making for us. The template for this mini-series has been Old Testament Ezra, a priestly descendant of Aaron himself, and a skilled scribe, well-versed in the law of Moses. His threefold mission was personal and practical. He prepared his heart to ponder or to study God's Word to do it or to practice it, and then to teach ordinances and statutes in Israel, or to proclaim it to others. And our goal today is similar. I want to observe God's truth so I might obey it by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then here's the icing on the cake, share it with others. 
How many of you like eating your cake without the icing? I mean, some of it is sicky sweet. I don't like that kind of icing. But a cake without icing is what? Incomplete. So here I'm studying. I'm, I'm drinking in the, the living truth. And I'm, I'm putting it into practice by the power of the Holy Spirit. But without being able to share it with somebody else and see them get blessed, I'm missing the icing on the whole package. This game plan aligns rather well with two priestly definitions I discovered. The first one is from Charles Hodge. A priest is a man duly appointed to act for other men in things pertaining to God. That's what a priest is. And immediately I thought of Paul's statement to Timothy. For there is one God, Timothy, and one mediator between God and men. And who is it? The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Now, commenting and taking this a little bit further, F.F. Bruce adds this. In many religious systems, there is a functionary whose special responsibility it is to represent his fellows before God and, when necessary, to intercede for them with God. He is commonly called a priest. So, in a session is a large part of priestly ministry. As I reflected on this, it occurred to me that to address the royal priesthood of believers without acknowledging the one who makes their ministry possible would be incomplete. I would be doing a disservice to you and to myself not to talk about the one who makes that royal priesthood possible. So, I feel compelled this morning to touch on the priestly ministry of our great high priest, the living Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Pray for me. I don't want to do him unjustly. I'm talking about him today, and so pray that I, I do it properly. Apart from Jesus, our priestly ministry is a moot point. But with Him, it blossoms into a fruitful and lifelong pursuit. Can we go to the book of Hebrews today? May we go to the book of Hebrews today? Someone says, I don't know if we can go to the book of Hebrews. So let me use the right word, may we. Yes, let's go to Hebrews in chapter 2. Now I'm going to tell you from the get-go, we've got some, you know, some Sundays there's like a few verses up on the overhead and, and we don't really open up the Bible. Or when we do, we don't read a lot of verses. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, we're reading a lot of verses today, so hang with me. By the time we get to the end, my prayer is that the light will go on, the nugget will be delivered, and you'll be encouraged, okay? So, so stick with me. Hebrews 2. The author of Hebrews is anonymous. We kind of think we know who he is, but he's anonymous. However, his treatise, or word of exhortation, as he defines it in chapter 13, is crystal clear. When you exhort someone, you don't fudge around the issue. You're there to exhort. You know what you want to say is clear as crystal, and you give it to him. So this is what he's going to do. His target audience was most likely a fellowship of Jewish Christians. The book is filled with Jewish illusions and, and, and illustrations, the whole nine yards. And these people have been walking with the Lord for some time. But they're in danger of something. They're in danger of, and I quote, lapsing into Judaism to avoid persecution being directed at Christians. And so they, they've been walking with the Lord for some time, second generation believers, and now because of persecution, there's a danger of them slipping back into Judaism. Our fellow Jews, they're not having such a rough time yet, but as Christians, we're getting it. To counter their abandonment of the faith, they're walking away from Christ, the author's theme articulates Christ's superiority. And the repetitive phrase that captures this is better than. Better than. Christ is better than the prophets, for He is God's final message. 
He is better than the angels, for they worship Him. He is better than Moses, since he created Brother Mo. He's better than Aaron's priesthood, since his singular sacrifice was for all time. He's better than the law or the old covenant because he mediates a better covenant. And he's better than the Levitical priesthood because his priesthood is eternal. Basically, as Criswell summarizes, Jesus the high priest, a title appearing only in the book of Hebrews, in his ministry and atonement for sins, is superior to anything offered by the collective ministry within Judaism. So, by establishing Christ's perfection, and his preeminence as encapsulated in the gospel, the author of Hebrews reveals his purpose, that his readers would never dream of surrendering their faith in Christ for anything, but instead would go on to perfection, would move forward to spiritual maturity, as he states in chapter 6. Question. Do you think the same concern still exists today within Christendom. Is it possible for church people today to be drawn away or diverted from Christ, especially when life heats up or disappoints? If that possibility is present, if that possibility still exists, then the message of Hebrews still applies. There's something God has for us in this book, even though it's distinctly Jewish in its focus. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, stop, don't read anymore. Whenever you read therefore, we ask, what's it therefore? Well, we find out in the previous verses, which speak of Christ's superiority and a divine sentence. You might not be able to see this one too well, so squint as I read. And to which of the angels has he, God the Father, ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. He's never said that to any of the angels, but he did say it to his son. Are they, the angels, not all ministering spirits, sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation, survey said. Yes, believe it or not, God's angels were created to be messengers to us. We're the ones that inherit salvation through faith in Christ. They're God's ministering spirits sent out to speak for God into our lives. How cool is that? Angel grams. Wow. Therefore, chapter 2 and verse 1, we, and the author includes himself, must give the more earnest heed all the more careful attention to the things we have heard. This is an imperative. We need to do this, lest we what? Drift away. Unless we slowly and gradually slip into a season of unbelief. Picture the boat moored to the dock. They failed to really tie it down. And that constant lapping of the waves, and it pulls on that, it unloosens, and that boat slips out of its mooring and drifts out to sea. It doesn't happen overnight. We need to pay careful attention to the things we have heard, the things that are true, lest we drift away. For if, verse 2, the word spoken through angels mediated in the presence of angels as it was on Mount Sinai as God delivered the law, proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect, not reject, but neglect or stop caring for so great a salvation? Which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. He came into Galilee preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He's the one that began the delivery. But it was confirmed to us by those who heard him, the apostles. 
God also getting in on it, bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts or distributions of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. Is it possible for God's people to drift? To be lulled into neglecting the faith they once stood for and shared with others? It is. So the need exists for us to stand secure in the once and for all sacrifice of our great high priest. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Let's go over to chapter 7. Where Christ's priestly credentials are further established. In chapter 6, the last two verses, 19 and 20... The writer identifies our true source of hope, both sure and steadfast, like an anchor for the soul, which enters the presence behind the veil, referring to God's heavenly presence, where He, the forerunner, and you know whenever you have a forerunner, that means others will follow, right? Others are to come, has entered for us. And who is He? Even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek who? Can we just call him Mel? Imagine having to write that name on the chalkboard in first grade a hundred times. Who does that to a kid? So who is Melchizedek? Let's find out. Jesus has become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So he must be someone important. For, verse 1 of chapter 7, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, or Jerusalem, priest of who? The Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, that's when he rescued his nephew Lot, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham, to whom Abraham also gave a tenth part of all. And so here's Abraham, the one who received the promises from God. In Jewish history, where does Abraham stand? He's uno numero uno. He's the big kahuna. He's the main squeeze. I mean, God started the Jewish nation with Abraham. He got the promises. Go out and I'll make your seed as the stars of the heavens and the sands of... You know, this is a, a top dog. And yet he is being blessed by Melchizedek and in turn giving tithes to Melchizedek. So Abraham here, Melchizedek here. Are you with me? All right, let's keep going. First, Melchizedek by his name being translated king of what? Righteousness. And then also king of Salem meaning king of peace. And isn't Jesus our righteousness? Hasn't He become that for us? Isn't He peace for us? Absolutely. Melchizedek, verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy. It doesn't mean He didn't have parents. Just there's no biblical record of who they are. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But made like or resembling in this, this foreshadowing The Son of God. He remains a priest for how long? Continually. Now consider how great this man was. To whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed those who are the sons of Levi. And by the way, Abraham was Levi's great-grandfather. Levi's not even shown up. You know, I mean, he comes later after Abraham before this incident. And indeed, those who are the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham, Levi. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, Melchizedek, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser Abraham is blessed by the better Melchizedek. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, 
for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, if perfection or complete communion with God were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek, this shadowy Old Testament figure who blessed Abraham, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he, Jesus, of whom these things are spoken, he belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. What? For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And is yet far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of fleshly commandment, but according to the of an endless life. For he, God, testifies in Psalm 110, you are a priest forever according to the order, not of Aaron, not of Levi, but of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect or complete. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to who? God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn Jehovah and will not relent. You, my son, are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety, a guarantee of what kind of covenant? A better covenant. And there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. You know, the Levites were always checking out. Thousand years of priestly service and they were dying right and left. Remember when Aaron was about to die? Moses takes his brother up the hill, uh, gets on the hill, takes off the priestly garments, puts them on Eliezer, his son. Dad dies, down they walk, and Eliezer is going to go at it until he dies and another takes his place. The Levites are always dying, and it prevents them from continuing. But verse 24, he, Jesus, because he continues for how long? forever has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, He is also able to save, to rescue, to deliver to the uttermost, completely and forever, those who come to God through Him, since He ever lives to make what for them? Intercession. The only other time this appears in Scripture. First time was in Romans, the verse I showed you, and here. That's a major part of his priestly service. He's praying for you. He's praying for me. Let's keep going. Verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us. What perfect provision God has given to us in his son who was holy he was harmless innocent undefiled he was separate from sinners and he has become higher than the heavens who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's for this he did once for all when he offered up himself he was not only the priest he was the sacrifice For the law, verse 28, appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Speaking of earthly sacrifices by weak men, I'd like to read the observation of one biblical scholar regarding an annual sacrifice that only the high priest was allowed to offer. This is what it says, and i got a picture for you to look at while I read. The wilderness tabernacle, like the Jerusalem temple later, 
consisted of two compartments, an outer and larger compartment, and an inner and smaller one. The outer compartment, the holy place, and the titles above it in the screen, was entered by priests every day in fulfillment of their sacred duties. The inner compartment, the holy of holies, was entered by no one except the high priest, and he entered it only once a year, on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. On that day, he entered it twice, on both occasions carrying in a basin the blood of sacrificed animals. The first animal, a bull, was sacrificed as a sin offering for the high priest and his family. Its blood was then taken into the Holy of Holies by the high priest and sprinkled in front of the mercy seat. And you can see it there. The covering of the Ark of the Covenant. When the high priest had thus been ceremonially purified from sin, he went out and killed a second animal, a goat, as a sin offering for the people and re-entered the Holy of Holies with its blood which he sprinkled in the presence of the invisible God in the same way. Now imagine being with a group of people on the outside of that scene. And you're waiting for the priest, the high priest, to emerge. Is he going to come out? If he doesn't come out... When he came out the second time, the people whom he represented breathed a sigh of what? Relief. <laughs> because he had emerged safely from such perilous nearness to the holiness of God. In fact, they made the incense so thick in the Holy of Holies that when the priest came in, he couldn't really see anything. It was, it was so, his presence wouldn't obstruct or obscure God's presence. The atonement which had been made for their sins was valid for the next 12 months. We're good to go until next year and we've got to do it all over again. So against this historical backdrop, and with 10 minutes yet to go, Let's continue with a further glimpse into the superiority of Christ's priesthood. Go over to chapter 10 of Hebrews. Chapter 10. And look at verse 11. Are you still with me? Good. The light bulb moment's coming. I think the nugget's going to be there. That's my prayer anyway. Verse 11. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Fact. Verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God because the job was finally finished. From that time, verse 13, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. My father told me that's what he's going to do. I'm still waiting for that. That day's coming. Verse 14, For by one offering he, Jesus, has perfected for how long? Forever. That's positional truth. Those who are being sanctified or set apart. That's practical reality. That's the here and now as we grow and learn to follow him and deal with sin. And the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws literally into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. They'll go from the tablets of stone, get on that fleshy part of the heart and mind. Then he adds their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. How many of you are still remembering how you blew it? Have you confessed it to God? Then he's forgiven it. And he says, I'm not going to remember it any longer. So why do we dredge that stuff up and live under a false guilt of like, ah, no, he forgives, he forgives completely. I'll remember it no more. That was an extra. Verse 18. Now where there is remission of these, forgiveness, there is no longer an offering for sin. Right? It's been forgiven. It's been dealt with. It doesn't have to, the offering doesn't have to happen again. Therefore, brethren... 
having boldness or confidence, this assurance to enter what? The holiest. That place that was forbidden in the old dispensation to everyone else but the high priest and only once a year. You now can boldly go in there by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which He inaugurated for us. He consecrated for us through the veil that is His flesh. And having this kind of high priest over the household of God, the great high priest over the universal church, let us today draw near. Keep on drawing near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. Let us keep on holding fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without leaning. Because when we're leaning, what happens? We're more susceptible to falling. So we go down the stairs now and I make sure I have three points of contact. Because one day I went down and I only had two and whoop, down I went. The older you get, you need three points of contact, right? You've heard that law. Let's not waver. Let's not lean. Let's hold fast to this confession, this agreement of our hope. For He who promised is faithful. He is utterly dependable. And in light of this, let us consider one another thoughtfully in order to to stir up, to to irritate, to incite, to, to stimulate. Think of the agitator in the washing machine. To what? Love. Love and good works. Did you catch the triad we just saw in there? Tucked in there in the folds? Faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is? And in verse 25, as we're agitating one another thoughtfully to love and good works, not forsaking or leaving in the lurch the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more, as you see the day approaching, the day is coming. The second appearing is going to happen. Verse 26. Now hang on. For if we sin willfully, if we go on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful expectation of what? Judgment. And fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Verse 28. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law, that inferior covenant, dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant, the new superior covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace, the one who who wooed you in the beginning, who took the first step toward you, Is the writer implying hell's eternal punishment for a follower of Christ who who drifts? No! Let me clear the air right now. No! Jesus said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. And what did His obedience as a loving Son accomplish? This is also in chapter 10 of Hebrews. Here it is. And by that will, we have been sanctified. We have been set apart, wholly dedicated to God through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ, our great High Priest, once for all. What does this mean? It means the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice is irrevocable. Once saved spiritually born again, always saved or born again. No Christian will ever be able to undo what Christ has provided. We cannot do it. 
I mean, who do we think we are that we can unravel that? But when we neglect so great a salvation by treating Jesus with disdain or His blood as having no special distinction, when by our actions or attitudes we disrespect the Holy Spirit, when we stop caring about the things that matter to God, even to the point of sinning willfully, we expose ourselves to what? Chastisement. Divine chastening. Such as what some in Corinth experienced. You know, the flaming fires don't have to be a reference to hell. There's other kinds of fires you can go through, right? Look at verse 30. For we know Him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge who? His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, saved or unsaved. I remember when I mucked up as a kid and when my dad would begin to walk down the hallway and I was beckoned to come with him. I looked at his waist. And when that belt disappeared... Ah, I knew what was coming. Did I cease being his son? He loved me. Was I about to get the fire of judgment? Yeah, because I mucked up. And it grieved his heart. But he did it out of what? Love for me. You want to end on a good note? They can wait for us. Positive note. This writer, and he's including himself, we, 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 over and over. He's a believer. He lowers the boom, but he's going to end on a positive note. Verse 32. But, but, what a conjunction. Remember Sesame Street? Conjunction, unction, what's your function? Or junction, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, thank you, English teacher. But, recall, go back Remember the former days in which after you were illuminated spiritually, you were enlightened, you endured a great struggle with suffering. You stood your ground with courage. Do you remember? Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me in my chains or on the prisoners. And you joyfully accepted the plundering of even your goods or possessions, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, in light of this, do not cast away your confidence. Don't let go of that boldness which has what? Great reward. For you have need of endurance, perseverance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And what is it? For yet a little while, and He who is coming will come and will not tarry. He will not delay. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But listen, we are not of those who draw back to perdition or destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul or the preservation of the life. How many of you enjoy delays? Delays are often difficult. They can be a tough pill to swallow. Especially when they're spiritual, like unanswered prayer. Unfulfilled promises. Satan, our enemy, loves to turn delays into demonic opportunities. His goal is spiritual dullness. I don't want you sharp. I want you dull. His goal is spiritual desertion rather than greater devotion to our great high priest. For instance, in Peter's second epistle, he looks ahead and Peter writes, scoffers will come in the last days. They'll be walking according to their own lusts or sinful pleasures. And this is what they'll be saying. Where's the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed. And it never will. God can't be trusted. Same old thing. Day after dreary day, I might as well eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow I'm going to check out. Now that 
attitude should not surprise any one of us when it's manifested by unbelievers. But when it appears among God's people, something is dreadfully wrong. So, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. For in just a very little while, He who is coming will come and will not delay. The Apostle John captures the Lord's promise in his final revelation. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. And what did John do? Oh, amen! Even so, come, Lord Jesus. But until He appears, how do we walk? By faith. Because the just, or those made right with God by Jesus, by faith in Jesus, shall live by faith. What a great high priest. One who is completely trustworthy. One who is worthy of our worship. I don't know where you're at today in your spiritual journey, whether you're up, down, or indifferent. You know, like that. Ever have those spiritual moments? What do I know? God cares for you. And He longs to draw you into a deeper relationship through His Son, your great high priest. It's, it's a daily experience. A lot of delights along the way, but aren't there also disappointments? Yeah, some pretty heavy disappointments. But that, when it makes all the difference, when you know that, you know what? Jesus is praying for me right now. I'm not fighting this alone. I may feel like it. I'm out here all by myself. But Jesus is praying for me. He is interceding for you. Keep trusting. I won't delay forever. I am coming through. And this life, by the way, doesn't have the final word. I do. I do. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your faithfulness. And I pray that in this week ahead, we would remember every step of the way as we seek to fulfill your will for our lives that you are interceding for us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this priestly ministry that is 24-7, that sustains us, that enables us to triumph here on this side of heaven until ultimately we're in glory with you. We love you. Go with us now as we head either to the meeting or, or back home. We ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless.